four pillars on which a good hair transplant is based in order of importance are survival, naturalness, coverage, and good donor area care. So, without survival, there is no transplant. There is a lot of disparity between surgeons in terms of survival. Very little surgeons do survival counts at the end of the process to know exactly what kind of percentage they are dealing with and how to better their yield. Controlling survival is a difficult task and there are multiple causes that can affect the growth rate. 1. The patient. Technically easy or hard, repair case or virgin scalp, frontal or crown area, advanced alopecia, or with a particular diagnosis like dupa, secretitial alopecia, scars, etc. 2. The extraction. FUT or FUE, manual versus motorized, transaction. 3. Preservation. Saline, preservatives, ATP, temperature, humidity. 4. Implantation. Premade incisions or direct, forceps, implanters or keep. 5. Local surgical complications, necrosis and nematomas. 6. Post op. Sun exposure, hair clippers, smokers. To avoid these causes, only two words come to mind study and experience. In this presentation, I wish to focus on two aspects that focally reduce survival, of which little is talked about in our meetings, reason why they are usually ignored. Necrosis, and especially, hematomas. Cutaneous necrosis consists in cell death in a certain area of tissue due to the lack of blood supply. It presents as violaceous or blackish areas that usually end up covered by a hard and adherent eschar. Once produced, it is irreversible. The most common cause is excessive use of anesthesia with vasoconstrictors, usually of greater affectation, or very superficial infiltration of it, more punctual lesions. Often confused with a cutaneous fibrotic hyperreaction, hair follicles come together in a fibrin mass that takes more than 15 to 20 days to fall off and sequentially leaves depressions and alterations of the normal color of the dermis. In the long term, there is an absolute lack of survival in the area. There is no treatment. The skin must be left to heal, the subcutaneous tissue regenerate and try a new transplant to the same area as if it were a scar repair. Let's look at a few examples. This patient had 3003 grafts extracted by FUE to restore his frontal and mid scalp areas. Thin hair, but good final coverage. In the immediate post op, we see a violaceous zone on the left side of his hairline, which transforms into a fibrotic magma. At 15 days post op, it evolves to a crusty spot, and at 20 days, it falls off, leaving an irregular dermis. At 5 months post op, worse development in that zone. And at 10 months, there is a good general result, but if you look closely, we see lesser growth in the marked zone. This other patient is a very mild case. Apparent good final result presents isolated crusts on his left side that reduce density and coverage at 10 months post-op. Another patient with a large post-surgical fibrotic component focalized in various frontal lesions. Bad result with a low survival in the affected zone. The next one is a pretty bad case with a big fibrotic component in the immediate post-op, especially on the left side, evolving to a crust that falls off at 20 days. At five months post-op, Poor growth in this zone is already apparent, and at 10 months, poor coverage is confirmed, especially in affected areas. Another patient with the same post-operative evolution, large fibrotic component on the left side that luckily resolves into small lesions on the left side. We see general good coverage upon evolution, but if we look more closely, it's possible to observe less density in the afflicted area. We do a little touch-up at 12 months, and after 5 months, complete coverage is observed. This last case is the most dramatic one. Same pattern, frontal restoration, two days of surgery, and an intense fibrotic reaction on the left side with the formation of crusts that take more than a month to fall off. At five months post-op, poor growth is confirmed in the same zone, and at 10 months, obvious lack of survival. We reoperated on him not long ago, and after shaving his hair, the typical skin alterations with depression, irregularity, and color shift with a whitish tone, which confirm a cicatricial component, could be seen. We now turn to the second complication, subcutaneous hematomas. A less spectacular entity, but equally incompatible with survival. Subcutaneous hematomas are inadvertent blood extravasions produced during the surgical act. In normal conditions, a subcutaneous hematoma in any part of the body is reabsorbed without any problem. But when in their core there are grafts that need to be nourished in the first days after surgery, survival is compromised. Theory tells us that grafts are fed by imbibition until neovascularization occurs. If in those first days the follicle is immersed in a subcutaneous clot, the exchange through the membranes is non-existent and survival is compromised. Let's look at some cases. Frontal restoration, 3700 units, 
very fair skin. In the immediate post-op, we can clearly see various hematomas on the right side. There is no fibrosis, nor crust, but at 5 months post-op, the fault is already apparent. And at 10 months, there's good general coverage that, however, does not hide the faulty survival. With hair shaved, we can observe how the spots where the hair is missing coincide with hematoma seen in the immediate post-op. On the second surgery, the defect was repaired with a good final result. Sometimes hematomas are hard to see, and we have to review photos when you suspect a bad survival. This patient shows lesser coverage on the left, central, and mostly right areas at 10 months post-op. Upon shaving for the second procedure, multiple spots where no growth can be seen. When we went back to the photo archive of the first surgery, we saw how those spots were similar to areas where you can make out various subcutaneous hematomas. Similar case, technically easy, apparent good result at 10 months, but if we look closely, there are survival faults on both sides. When reviewing photos, we found small bruises that justify these spots. The patient was reoperated on to improve coverage. One of the worst growths in the last two years. This patient evolved very slowly, and I don't think we have reached 60 or 70% survival. In this case, we realized from the very beginning that the hematomas were clear. And in this case, the hematoma was detected straight away in a frontal implantation with high density that did some large hematomas on the left frontal area. We'd already warned the patient about the possible need for a touch-up, and indeed, evolution at 5 and 10 months confirmed our initial prognosis. Another frontal restoration. Hematoma was obvious on the left side in the immediate post-op. The final outcome could have a good result, but when we look at it in a close view, we can identify the lack of coverage, density, and hairs per graft in the pointed area. The only way to avoid bruising is preventive. Good technique and good hemostasis, inserting into the vascular plane with the necessary inclination, dissecting instead of cutting, and if they're detected during surgery, increase the medicines with saline to minimize clotting. What's exposed in this presentation is the result of observation in the search for the greatest possible survival. Improvement in personal survival is something that should be in the DNA of every surgeon. Study your own results and analyze those small faults. It's the best way to gain experience.